What was the kite shield and why was it introduced? In this video we're going to find out. G'day guys, my name is Ben and welcome to Medieval Mayhem. On this channel you'll find lots of videos about medieval reenactment, about culture, about the religion and the politics of the time. You'll find lots of reviews into gear and you'll find lots of DIY videos into costuming and medieval furniture. Today we're going to talk about the kite shield. I believe actually one of the most iconic shields of the whole medieval period. So let's dispel a few myths because I think that's quite important. So let's start by dispelling a few myths. I do believe there's no references in the early part of the medieval period referring to this as a teardrop shield or a kite shield or a Norman shield. It was simply known as shield. It was introduced during the 10th century, not the 11th. A lot of people see the Bayou Tapestry and simply assume that this shield came into being in 1066, which is not the case at all. We can see a lot of iconography at the time which relates this shield back to around 950 AD. Clearly this shield has a great deal of Byzantine influence who were using a similar shield at the time and therefore it's easy enough to, to believe that this shield came into Europe from the east through the Varangian Guard uh, primarily staffed by the Viking mercenaries at the time or so-called Vikings but also through many many cultures were represented it's simply primarily uh, Danes and Norwegians who but not exclusively uh, who staffed the Varangian Guard uh, it's very much so that there were Anglo-Saxons in there as well if you look at the shape of this shield you can see it's very much a teardrop shape uh, and then into the 13th century you start to see flat top uh, kite shields and then the heater shield starts to become more popular as the kite shield shrinks in length that said the kite shield remained a very popular shield throughout the whole medieval period and was still used uh, I believe in the 1600s in Venice uh, with their gondolas who used to do a lot of jousting there. I did a video on making a uh, kite shield just recently and it's typically made of uh, something like poplar wood or similar around about six or so millimeters thick it is a curved shape um, that said other types of wood would have been used as well they would have then used a cheese based glue and then laminated onto the the wood something like linen which was very very common uh, indeed also so was uh, rawhide or types of leather the edging as you can see here is rawhide uh, and that stops the effect of um, bladed weapons such as axes and um, swords and so on and striking in splitting the wood rawhide is actually incredibly strong once it's dried out some kite shields had a shield boss and others did not the evolution of the kite shield is very interesting whilst the kite shield became very popular throughout Europe uh, particularly England Wales today or what is today France Germany Italy and those sorts of countries uh, it was far less um, popular in other parts of Europe and indeed many parts of the world never really got away from the round shield and, and I find that very interesting where Ireland um, basically stuck with the round shield so did what is today India today Pakistan Afghanistan and those sorts of countries Africa and so on so um, I, I believe very, uh, the reason we see a shield which provides so much protection to the legs uh, is that the shield wall tactics that were commonly used uh, towards the end of the so-called dark ages uh, in the sort of 8th and 9th century and you see um, the Danax coming into light and coming into play a Danax typically had a, a shaft which was much longer than this and allowed for uh, an incredible reach this actually could have had a, uh, a handle as much as 1.6 meters long and with a handle like that it allows me to 
reach way beyond my shield wall uh, and if I'm lucky I can grab someone, hook into their armour or hook into, um, they grab them by the ankle and drag them out from their shield wall, from their protection and butcher them in front of their colleagues. And therefore it's easy to understand why the teardrop shaped shield starts to come into play. A lot of people regard the, uh, the kite shield as being very much a, a cavalry shield and it's, it's obviously very useful for cavalry um, and you see it uh, in much of the tapestries and the iconography of the time being used in a cavalry type scenario although it's not actually the case this was a strictly a cavalry shield. In, in fact um, the Anglo-Saxons used this during the Battle of Hastings and throughout that kind of late 10th and throughout the 11th century and the Anglo-Saxons almost exclusively fought on foot. They would ride uh, their horses to the site of the battle but then dismount and fight in a shield wall type tactics. So this shield had a great value in the, uh, in the shield wall. In cavalry use because cavalry are used, um, and if you look at how, um, uh, if you look at how medieval cavalry fought, they fought knee to knee, and they might be, you know, 50, 100, 250, or 500 or so knights all lined up knee to knee. Their shields typically slung behind them, and a lance out in front. So. Using this shield, particularly in, in that way, wasn't, wasn't really done. And that large kind of melee type environment, which often is depicted in Hollywood, but is actually very unrealistic, um, wouldn't really happen very often. All it would require to, to defeat one enemy was typically to cre uh, create 10 or 20% casualties, and they would therefore become an ineffective, combat ineffective. So, in terms of infantry use, and when I'm using this shield on foot, um, this shield gives me a, a lot of uh, value. Not only um, can I use it from the point of view of uh, this protecting me, but it provides a great deal of offensive type capability as well. This is a weapon in itself. I can push very hard with it, and it's a very strong shield because of its shape and because it's been laminated with um, the linen as I described earlier you then create this sort of fiberglass type uh, effect and the shield is incredibly strong once it's been made properly. Unlike a round shield which was typically held out in front of the person and you see a lot of reenactors still keeping them uh, with their arms along the, um, the wooden edge of the shield. Whereas iconography of the time actually depicts a round shield being used right out in front. The kite shield was very different and it required, because it was typically but not exclusively strapped and we'll talk more about this in a second, but because the shield was strapped to your arm, it then uh, meant that you had to fight closer to the shield. There were many different types of strap configurations, and you can actually see this in the Bayou Tapestry. Almost all of the shields that are being used are actually strapped in slightly different ways. Uh, and it's a very interesting because depending on whether you're in an infantry type environment or whether you're on a horseback, uh, and I do train on horseback, um, then you, you would actually use the shield in, in different ways. The, from my infantry point of view, I prefer to have my arm um, pretty much horizontal to the ground. Whereas if I'm using a, a, a kite shield from horse, then I prefer to have it my arm at about a 30 or so degree angle. I find that works very well for me. Whilst dismounted though, then I prefer to, to use the shield like so. Uh, this creates a great deal of protection for me. Not only am I protected 
my upper body, but my head and I can use my shield far more effectively than I could a round shield to uh, block weapons and then make a counter attack with that. Uh, I, I, you can obviously also use it in, in this sort of direction as well and um, and that so it, it simply depends on the individual warrior as to how they best prefer to use their shield in order to um, create the best effect for them. I find there are many people in reenactment circles who like to use um, the shielding in quite different ways. There are very few surviving examples of a kite shield and I think that's a real shame. Um, you do see them very occasionally popping up on uh, the auction websites um, but very hard, they're very hard to actually carve and date because of the um, preservatives that sometimes people use. If we talk more about the, the strap configuration that I've got on this particular one um, I've got the two straps for holding it horizontally and then I've got the two straps to hold the shield vertically. This strap is my shoulder strap. This strap is my shoulder strap and it's technically known as a gige. I need to get a buckle for it though so I don't have a buckle on just at the moment. The other thing about this particular shield is it should have had a layer of linen on, on the inside face um, but for whatever reason I didn't put one on, on this particular shield. Um, I prefer to hand stitch the shield edgings. I simply find that creates a much better finish for myself and I've, I find it much more, I, I believe it much more historically accurate. Uh, I've seen a lot of people use um, nails and that kind of thing. Uh, I, I just don't feel that's actually the way it would have been done because um, nails would have been so incredibly expensive. A historic nail takes around 15 minutes or so to produce for a blacksmith and therefore it's, um, the cost of nails would have been incredibly high and I don't believe that a shield would necessarily um, represent that kind of value because a shield is not designed to last necessarily in battle. Um, a shield may last in, for a battle, it might last two or three but it wouldn't necessarily because, um, and you can see this in, in the descriptions of the medieval period, that squires would be required to hold two, three or four shields for their, their knights uh, because, and a knight would ride back to their squire and simply get a new shield and then carry back on into the, um, into the battle scene. At this time, at the uh, medieval period, you would have found armies consisting of thousands of soldiers as opposed to armies consisting of um, during the earlier parts of the medieval period armies could very well consist of maybe just a hundred or 120 soldiers and the raid on Linda's farm uh, only consisted of three ships so really looking at a maximum of 180 you would have uh, been logical to maintain a small force of soldiers at the beach to protect the ships and possibly a small force um, on the beach itself um, to protect the Viking camp if there was one. We don't actually know how long the raid itself lasted for. So you could therefore surmise that maybe 120 or so soldiers went into raid uh, at, at that particular time. Um, and this is obviously 8th century type tactics during the ninth century you start to see armies becoming bigger with you know a few hundred versus a few hundred in the 10th and 11th century as the kite shield starts to come in the armies get bigger and bigger still in the 10th century you're seeing um, in the 10th century you're starting to see armies in the thousands and in the um, 11th and 12th centuries, you're starting to see several thousand soldiers actually fighting uh, versus, again, several thousand soldiers. So again, I do believe the kite shield has a lot to do with that. Shield walls and uh, those kind of protective measures now becoming far more efficient and far more significant. It might be sort of six or seven rows deep um, of soldiers. Uh, alrighty guys, I really hope you enjoyed my video about the kite shield. 
Um, please like, subscribe and share and I'll catch you in my next video.